Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Talking Points. We uh, had a brief hiatus there. We uh, a few weeks ago we, we recorded two episodes, and quickly we re quickly realized uh, that we had some technical difficulties, and we only had about twenty minutes of footage. Um, so it, it took a little bit for us to get back together and record a few episodes, but here we are. So. What we're going to do this episode is we're just going to cover a little bit of ground we covered in those two lost episodes just because we kind of wanted to talk about this, this, those issues some more. And we're also going to cover some just new things we sought out or a couple new things in the news. Um, so that's kind of the situation we're in. Um, one video we watched and discussed uh, in one of the lost episodes was an interview with Milton Friedman on... Uncommon Knowledge, which is like an interview show done through the Hoover Institution. And there was one part that really uh, caught my co-host. It caught his attention because Milton Friedman is a libertarian, but he makes all of his arguments and on a very consequentialist basis. He's a libertarian because it works. And uh, typically on this show, I make libertarian arguments based on the moral, the, the morality of it. So that kind of caught his eye and we had a, we had a good discussion about that. And, um, and there, was a, there was a lot of interesting content there, um, just from Milton Friedman being Milton Friedman. Um, so I'm not sure if you want to intro that a little bit more and kind of throw out your, your first reaction. Um, and if you can give your thoughts on that, then that might lead into, into my, my response. Sure. Uh, what interested me about the... You can hear me, right? What interested me about the interview probably stems from my interest in libertarianism in general. I have a sort of a love-hate relationship with libertarianism. Uh, I think I, 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 I'm, I pulled up the Wikipedia definition last time, so I'm just going to do that again for uh, simplicity's sake. Uh, according to Wikipedia, the Libertarian Party is a political party in the United States that promotes civil liberties, non-interventionism, laissez-faire capitalism, and shrinking the size and scope of government. Now, I completely agree with the Libertarians on civil liberties issues. I probably agree with them the majority of the time. Uh, on foreign policy, although that's a whole other kettle of fish we won't get into tonight. What I disagree about li uh, with libertarianism is uh, the belief in unfettered uh, or nearly unfettered capitalism and the belief that the government needs to be, or th th that the government that government involvement is generally a bad thing. Uh, so that, 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 I guess those would be my uh, uh, opening thoughts. Okay, yeah, that's a, 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 that's a good way to intro it and to kind of bring up libertarian in your immediate reaction, um, which I think is funny. I, I think this is why I... Um, I mean, this harkens back to a few episodes ago when I was giving you a hard time about, to some extent, self-describing as a libertarian. Um, and it quickly gets into, like, the no true Scotman's, Scotsman territory. But the, the reason why I was uh, so irked by your conceptualization is the, the civil liberties part in that definition, I think to most libertarians, that includes having freedom from government in the sense of unfettered capitalism. Um, is kind of like anybody's ability to kind of do whatever they want with their money. And I would group that into civil liberties, and I think pretty much all of it ties into that. So that, that's why when you uh, hit on unfettered capitalism, I'm like, well, you're hitting on civil liberties to attack, uh, to, you know, manage capitalism or, you know, any of your thoughts on that front. Um, but then, I mean, but, but, but for the most part, I do see where you're coming. I do, I have noticed where you do fall in line with typical libertarian orthodoxy and where you stray. So, 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 so that is valid. Um, and Milton Friedman in that interview kind of really has a way of kind of, I feel like throwing curveballs at your vantage point because he specifically explains why government makes things inefficient. Um, 
if, if that makes sense. And that's like a lot of what he was talking about, about the FDA, where he talked about um, the lives that would be saved um, <laughs> if we went about passing drugs uh, faster and sooner. And it could help more people ahead of time because we wouldn't have as much of a regulus, of a, of a re regulation um, type of we wouldn't have a time frame to work with. We have to get everything, you know, p passing all these different rules and all, all this stuff you wouldn't have to deal with. So more life-saving drugs would get there faster. And just a few of those would save tons of lives. And then you get the consequentialist argument that I know you're more sympathetic to hearing just because that appeals more to your kind of intuitions, I guess, if, if that's fair. Um, but 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 how, how I come into this, I guess, is... um. I, I heard this really, really great um, quote. I'm not going to try to say it because um, I butcher it. But Mur Mur so famous libertarian Mur Murray Rothbard, or, or what? Or was it Mises? Crap, I'm, I'm screwing it up. I think it was Mises. Um, he pretty much called Milton Friedman a communist because <laughs> by by looking at it in terms of consequentialism and ignoring the um, the more, ignoring the moral argument meant that he was accepting the premise that it was about efficiency and that it wasn't about rights. And that was essentially offensive to Mises. And to some extent, I can relate to that a lot um, because I think first and foremost, it's easy for me to just say, well, that policy is bad because you shouldn't use the government's mandate on force to fund said thing. Um, but then I do appreciate Milton Friedman's work in the sense that he goes through and he says, well, even if you are well-intentioned, it's not going to always work out. Here's all these times it hasn't worked out. Um, and, and, and I know that you're, you've been pretty open to that when I've made those kinds of arguments in the past. Two, I have two points uh, right off the bat. Uh, firstly, when I said, uh, when I uh, called myself a uh, left-leaning or left-wing libertarian, I was using... Uh, li the, t the word libertarian with a lowercase l, <laughs> I, I was contrasting libertarianism versus authoritarianism. Uh, I, I, I think there's a, there's a slight distinction to, to be made between lower, uh, libertarianism with a capital L and, and libertarianism with a lowercase l. Uh, the second point, I think I think I'm more open to I, I you know I, I'm not gonna argue that the state is uh, always a good thing or that, that oh, that's a silly statement let me start over <laughs> I'm not going to argue that the uh, the state always perpetuates good things or, or, or always does the right thing in, in fact quite often states do the wrong thing and quite often states bungle things up majorly and you can just go throughout human history and you see this I, I think the distinction I would make is I uh, I accept a certain level of uh, state ineptitude. I, I, I think that uh, to some extent if, if nation states are to be or if, if the nation state is to uh, continue on which obviously some people believe it uh, some people believe it will be abolished or, or just disbanded for whatever reason but for now, at least, we have nation states. Uh, I don't see them going away in the foreseeable future, at least. And so I, I think I'm probably more, uh, I, I probably view it more as just like a necessary evil than I think you do. I view the state as a necessary evil. And I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think you view it as an unnecessary evil. Well, okay, so... I mean, the, 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 there is a road to go down there, right? Where I obviously, I, I would say the state doesn't need to do all kinds of things that you would think is the state's responsibility to do. Now, I, I did have like a very um, organic question, though. Um, and the, this is kind of a very practical question. Um, because you are willing to admit the follies of the state in a lot of ways. Um, 
and I'm not going to make a grand statement like, then why do you, why don't you reject the state completely <laughs> or anything like that? It's just in this moment where in the United States of America, it feels like government has ballooned a lot. So even if you wouldn't consider yourself remotely a libertarian, at least in the moment of like the current, you know, country that we're in right now, do, why, why wouldn't you consider yourself at least a libertarian if you could pick three directions to go? Why, why wouldn't libertarianism be like the number one choice? Because I'm sure like if we went through all the things that the government currently does and is horribly inefficient, you would probably come to the conclusion, and I could be wrong to assume that, but I feel like you could come to the conclusion that there's more that we need to get rid of that we're doing that is inefficient or just bureaucratic and unnecessary and it's not getting anything done then we do need to expand it. That There's so much dead weight of um, programs and re redundancy um, that we aren't going to do anything about. Could you rephrase the question? So, I, I, yeah, I guess I'm saying in, in this political moment in the United States in 2019, why aren't you a libertarian if you recognize that the state does do a lot of things poorly and our, the, our current government does a ton of things poorly right now. So even if you don't buy into the libertarian premises of, you know, you're not, you're in goal, it's not anarchy, but at least short term, why aren't you a libertarian? I see. Okay. That's a fair question. Um, and it takes a complex answer. <laughs> yeah. In, in the short term, I, I think in the short term, I am far more, uh, what's I'm trying to think of the correct term. Not conservative, but in the short term, I am far more maybe pragmatic would be the term. I, I'm I'm struggling for words here, but it, um, I, I think in the in the short term, I think um. The, the government can, or I, I think we can use the government for better ends. P per perhaps that perhaps that's not true in the long term. Yeah, I, I, as I was formulating my question, I think I did kind of stumble upon, I guess, what I would think your answer would be. So, so, so let me throw Go it ahead. out there because uh, another thing we talked about. Um, on one of our lost episodes, one of the famed lost episodes, was we went, we went through Dave Rubin's interview with Andrew Yang. Yes. And um, the more I've heard Andrew Yang and the more I reflect on what he said, the more he strikes me as, I guess, you, what your mindset is. Because Andrew Yang was directly asked about, you know, bureaucracy. And he kind of said, well, like, the reason why he's for UBI is because UBI doesn't need bureaucracy. You just give everybody the check that opts in. You don't need people to go in and you don't need caseworkers to make sure everybody meets their said qualifications. So there's not all this weight of, you know, people who are getting paid 40000 a year managing it. So it sounds like you would be a liberal in the sense that Andrew Yang is. He still thinks we need to give Medicare for everybody. And he still thinks he wants to help people in an efficient way. But I also feel like if somebody came up to Andrew Yang and said, here's where incentives are completely wrong because of this program, and it's just bloated and it's not doing anything it was set out to do, he wouldn't be afraid to cut it, right? So is that a good way of describing kind of, I guess, how you would see it now? Yes, I think in the, I think, uh, in, I think uh, in our current uh, political climate, li the, the liberalism or the liberals are... Um, the least, how, how, let's see, well, I think well, a couple episodes ago we brought up the quote um, by uh, Winston, Winston Churchill, democracy is the worst, uh, worst system of government except for all the others. Uh, and I, I think per, per, perhaps I, while I wouldn't, I don't call myself a liberal anymore, uh, I'm certain. I, I'm certain that I still. I, I mean, I used to be a liberal, and I. I, I, uh, I certainly don't repudiate everything that I stood for, as a liberal. And I, I think that. Uh, in in this in in the United States, at least, 
that there really isn't uh, a, a mainstream radical party. I, I suppose maybe the Libertarian uh, Party would be the closest one, uh, or the Green Party. Uh, pick your choice. <laughs> um, and, and I think you know you mentioned uh, you know even if I don't agree with all uh, the, the Libertarian. Uh, presuppositions, or, or with all the libertarian intuitions, wh why would I not support libertarianism? Why would I not support libertarianism? And I think I put a lot of emphasis on the uh, intuitions of libertarianism. In other words, I, I think that while, as I said, I, I have a love-hate relationship with it, I, 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 I think libertarians and I certainly do align on a fair amount. But I think that my first principles probably align more with the liberals than with the libertarians, even though, as I said, I no longer consider myself to be uh, in the, in the, uh, a liberal in the dictionary uh, definition. That, that's totally fair. And like I, I do personally, like in our discussions, I always put a strong emphasis on the um on the first principles and kind of well what, what I see is the uh, acceptable and not acceptable when it comes to government and I mean I've been thinking about this a lot especially as 2020 slowly uh, gets closer and like like that the reason why even if it was Andrew Yang versus Donald Trump I'd have a hard time voting for Andrew Yang just because all of his conceptualizations where he starts from is so far from where I start from that I I can't it's hard for me to endorse him and the more the it depends on uh, depends on the day, but even the, the the more statist Republicans, I I can't believe that I'm technically a registered member of their party just because <laughs> ju 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 just because there are plenty of Republicans who will actually ask the question of is this the role of government? And you know even though like Ben Shapiro is a partisan hack and you know he gets in a lot of uh, shenanigans with him being essentially you know a um, What's the word for it? He's a talking head on TV. In the end, he's a talking head on TV. He's not a philosopher. Um, but the thing is, the reason why, if I'm going to listen to a talk radio guy, it's essentially him, is because he at least starts from similar principles as me. He'll usually say, is this even the role of government? Um, and I think that's a really important question. Um, but most Republicans, and the more I listen to actual Republicans who I like to talk, the more I realize that they're about as statist as Democrats are. They, they, they just will not agree that the 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 uh, policies will work, or they'll say that they we can't afford them without raising taxes, and we don't like more taxes. So the, it, it almost never is the this is not the role of government. And I have a hard time lining up with people with status principles. Um, so that's give, that's giving me a lot of cognitive dissonance. I almost feel like I shouldn't even vote. Um, which I mean that, that's a whole new topic, I and mean, that's a whole other topic we'll probably tackle sometime. Um, because I have a lot of thoughts on if people should vote or if voting's ethical. Um, I also think when people wear those I voted stickers, I think that's a political messaging and I don't think people should necessarily be proud of it. Um, but that, but that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But I guess when we are talking about who we identify with most principles wise, it's the libertarians, but not even Milton Friedman, because he, he does, he, he does accept that whole, um, conceptualization of there being a pie of resources. And he just thinks capitalism does it in the most efficient way. Um, and I just, and can I, I ask just you, reject that a little bit. So yeah, yeah. Can I ahead. ask you a question, actually? Yeah. Uh, well, before I ask the question, uh, I, I am as the uh, I have as many reservations about being a registered Democrat as you do <laughs> about being a registered Republican. <laughs> so th there's a there, there's our um, our, our uh, consensus. <laughs> that, that, that there's where we um, in equal but opposite ways mm -hmm. overlap. Now, my question actually is, uh, in our discussion, in, our, in, our, in the Lost uh, episodes, which I guess is what we're calling them now, <laughs> uh, in, in, in the, it sounds kind, of, um, sounds kind of cool, actually, the Lost <laughs> episodes. It, it makes them sound better than they were. I, I know, right? <laughs> um, anyway, in, in, in the Lost episodes, uh, we went down... In the, uh, I think the second episode we recorded, which was the discussion on uh, Dave Rubin's interview with Andrew Yang, we, we went down a, a bit of a rabbit hole um, because we started uh, uh, asking the question, 
does uh, does Andrew Yang uh, view d d does Andrew Yang um, uh, what are, what are his views on uh, human rights? Uh, and I, I think we kind of went around the bend on that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I won't. We we don't need to rehash that. Uh, but, but I only I bring that up because I I guess I I what my question is I, I want to try to understand um, since I, I I think you somewhat reject the idea of rights now, now, now let me let me add the caveat that that doesn't mean you think that uh, uh, we shouldn't um, treat people as if they have rights. Uh, I think that was the distinction you made, if I remember correctly. You can obviously uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Now, so it, it seems to me that the quintessential libertarian argument is that it is based on rights, the right to property, the, the right to free exchange of goods and services. Yeah. So, so are you do you are you following my my question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's just the reason why I always get I always get funky when it comes to the rights discussion is because I since I don't have any um I guess uh, spiritual values I don't have any of these existential you know beliefs um it, it's hard to find a reason why we are rooted in these, you know, extra valuable things beyond us just being people. It's hard to say we deserve this just because we're alive and human when we live in a world of, like, you know, animals that don't get the same treatment, blah, 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 blah. And the whole idea of rights is very abstract um, because it's almost it's almost like when people talk about rights, they're talking about something spiritual, like because that we have the human spirit, we have these rights. Um, and when I, when I talk about, you know, how we should all have the rights, you know, all the rights I talk about are pretty much things I'm just saying the government should not infringe upon, which is kind of how the Constitution's worded. So, so we have the right to free speech, but the right to free speech, you know, the First Amendment, isn't really about we all. It's not we all have the spiritual value of the right. It's government's not allowed to infringe on that because we think it's something that's we we hold valuable. So, so what I kind of do is I don't really have a good reason why we should have rights. I don't have these uh, godly roots of my thinking that most conservatives can point back to. I, I don't say because we were all like the, we were all born by God. We all have um, the, these true, we, we all like have these certain um, unalienable rights. But like, I guess I'm just assuming that assumption is valid, even though I don't have a reason to. Um, I, I would also say, to some extent, I get very, very subjectivist. I think there are good reasons why people can value different things when it comes to how they live their life, what their, their personal value hierarchy, and all these things. I could see why somebody could value it differently. And I think if you are more of a subjectivist, I think things can actually get very libertarian really quickly because then it quickly becomes, well, then nobody should be able to impose anything on anybody else because you, do not have, you, do, you don't have the same values, right? You can't impose this on somebody because everybody has their own morals. So you should kind of let leave everybody alone. I um, mean, you shouldn't let that. You shouldn't have um, tyrannical values. But yeah, so, so since I kind of reject those uh, th those almost re religious premises, I have a hard time, you know, pu putting. Uh, I have a hard time building that basis. But I just start with the assumption that it is true, because almost everybody acts and operates as if it's true, right? So at least in a practical way, it is true, even if I don't have a spiritual reason. Um, but with that being said, I don't like when people say that for a practical reason it's true, therefore I'm going to act like it is this spiritual thing. I just don't, I find that reverse logic not convincing, but I think it's an okay way to make an, a general argument of a philosophy to live by. So, so then, then, then your, uh, your critique then of the idea of rights is, is more uh, just, just a critique of you don't know or you you can't you can't uh, or you don't see how a abstract philosophical argument um, based on or that that doesn't have uh, a religious basis can come up with objective moral uh, framework. But you you think that so you think it's it's uh, rights are a 
social construct which we should live by anyway. Well, the, the, there are a lot of things that are socially constructed, and I don't think that's really a negative by any means. Um, no, I no, think, no, I'm not saying yeah, it is. I, I know, but there's, there's kind of a stigma when people say, like, you know, people will say, like, gender is socially constructed, as if that, that means gender does not exist because it is socially constructed. And it's like, well, socially constructed things do exist. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of them. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. So, so, so to some extent, I do agree. Um, I, I agree with most of what you just said. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm glad I brought that up. I, I was kind of brooding on, on our, <laughs> on our conversation about rights because I, I felt like we didn't really get to the crux of the matter. But, but well, now I understand what, what you're. I, I now, I, now I understand the argument you're making. Well, he, okay. So the, the thing is, the, no, I was actually, we, because we ended on that note, and it was, it was a little heated because I didn't really have a satisfying answer, and I think, and I think it's just because I think the conceptualization of how people use the term rights is just really wrong to me. Because people say, well, everybody has a right to say freedom of speech. But we all know when we say that right that we don't really mean everybody has the right to say whatever they want at all times. When we talk about the First Amendment, we, we, we know that like nobody, we, we don't want 10 people to stand up during the middle of a movie that's packed and start screaming and not get kicked out by the ushers. Like, no, we want them to get kicked out. We don't want them to talk then. So it's like, well, is that an infringement? Well. In America, it's not because our, our rights are, uh, it's about government, right? It's about keeping government from, you know, silencing people. And then that, that's a private property situation. And since it's private property, we can kick people out. And then nobody's saying it's a rights infringement. So clearly the freedom of speech isn't about individual to individual. It's about individual to government, right? So even though people say it's God-given, it's like those rights are God-given, but it's still relational to government. So that's why I don't like saying the rights are given by government because the rights are freedoms from government. Um, but when people imply that it has to be spiritual, it just it, I don't find it convincing that that's a requirement. Uh, I, I completely agree. Okay, cool. Um, but, but, but it does get funky because I would argue that there are more things we should be free from than government because, because I think government should have such a limited role. Because I don't think we need government for most things. So, like, I think we should be free from, you know, being coerced to pay taxes for all kinds of things because it shouldn't be the government's role. Um, but we don't have that right in our country. And I think another another point that we talked about uh, uh, in in the in the last episode was oh my brain just uh, <laughs> my brain just turned off. Um, you're fine. I do want to note that I'm I'm really glad you you brought that up because I st I feel like I stumbled. I remember. I remember oh. now. Okay, l l let me finish this thought. I, I do feel like I stumbled my way into a somewhat satisfying answer there, even though I did not expect the question. And I'm really excited to listen back to it so I can hear if I made any sense. And that that's the fun of recording. <laughs> okay, go well, ahead. I'm, I'm functioning on two hours of sleep, so I hope I can uh, speak coherently. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I remember now uh, the the other point I was going to make, or the, the other point that we that uh, we did make, or that I did make, and and that I, I want to reiterate here. I think if if I have a more if I am more accepting of government authority, I, I think it's because I am also s suspicious of uh, of, of uh, religious authority of economic authority I, I think I, I in, in some in some in some uh, aspects I, I view uh, gov the government's role uh, is to check uh, authority in other domains and I again it's it's like a necessary evil like like um, I think like uh, an example uh, that I believe we will probably completely disagree on Although perhaps for different reasons, is the idea of uh, the government's relationship to marriage. Now, my view, or I, I'm okay with the government being involved in marriage uh, because I am very suspicious of the. Uh, uh, Religion, religious authority having control of marriage. That, that's not to say you can't get married in a church, 
uh, or you can't have a, a, a religious uh, ceremony. But I, I'm, I'm very suspicious of allowing uh, the church to be the prime, uh, the, the prime, for, the primary force uh, backing marriage. Uh, and and I know you're not religious, so y you're you're not your your argument against the uh, government's uh, role in marriage would not be that argument. But some people would make that would make that argument. Some people do believe that the church should be. Uh, the primary the primary authority in marriage and I just disagree with that okay I uh I think I have a lot of problems with that argument like so 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 let's let's bunker down and go down a rabbit hole um <laughs> well so I want to start off by saying my, my current issue with the government being involved in marriage is mostly the government's involved in marriage um is because it allows married people privileges um, they, they pay taxes differently and, um, that there are different things that go along with marriage, um, that are related to that, which is why the government gets interferes. And I don't think the government should privilege one lifestyle over the other. Um, and even though it's not really incentivizing one over the other, I don't think they should privilege it. Um, I don't see why that doesn't constitute this discrimination. It's mostly just cause it's not a protected class. Um, but yeah, so that, that's my issue first and foremost. Um, now here's. I guess, wow, okay, so, so there's lots on bundle with, um, so, so, so when we talk about tyranny outside of government, my general issue is there is no business that can coerce me the same way the government can. Like, th there are ways that, like, a business could discriminate against me if I wanted to buy something and they said, no, because we don't like you, I'd be being discriminated against, but that is significantly different than, you know, the, them threatening to throw me in a cage if I, you know, did something they didn't like. Um, if I gave five thousand dollars to a candidate, and so if, you know, if that's more than a limit, I can get thrown in a cage. That's a lot different than you know a business saying you can't buy my product or you can't have my service, um, which is why I get hung up there. Now, but I want to talk about the this the marriage example because I so even if the church has said we will only marry people who are both of this certain religion. And they didn't want to give the, the thing is the m religious groups wouldn't have a monopoly on it because anybody could go get a contract and that they could both sign it saying we are married. Nobody would have authority over it. There'd be no reason why, even if the, go if the government wasn't involved, why two people couldn't sign a contract that essentially gave them all the relationship rights. You would just let contract law take over it instead of having the government rubber stamp it. So that, that's why I don't see why I don't see how religions could, be authoritarians about it because religions don't have the authority to stop people from both signing consensual contracts. If that makes sense. Yes, that uh, I mean I, I I see where you're coming from. I, I think the I mean the, the religious you know religious authority. Uh, uh, ec economic or, or ca capitalist authority uh, and and government authority uh, they, they're different authorities yes I, I I will grant that but but I I think that I, I'm suspicious of all of them uh, so I I do want to clarify I'm suspicious of like, like I know businesses can do wrong with power. I know religion can do wrong with power, but I think their means, and I think this is where I differ from you, is anytime I see those wrongs, the means that they do those things that are wrong is with government. So like when businesses, um, you know, use their power to push congressmen into these, into essentially subsidizing companies that don't need subsidies and you get that crony capitalism going on, that that's an issue with businesses, but then they use the means of government to get to those kind of bad ends. I don't like that. And that's with a lot of um, anti-competition regulations. Businesses will get the lobby Congress to force regulations on their industry. So people can't compete with them and they can keep their place at the top. And that's bad, but that's because these government is the means. Well, when religions lobby the government to do certain things, or when large voting populists of evangelicals vote for the same things, 
they vote for the government to then hammer it down on everybody. And I, I just, I guess when I think of those groups doing bad things, it's usually with, with government. Cause, cause if a bunch of religious people decide something, I just don't care. I opt out of their group. So I'm like, what's good. I don't live your lifestyle. I don't care if you disapprove. So I, I guess that's why I'm having a hard time uh, conceptualizing your concern outside of that. The, the, well, I think that that is the crux of our disagreement then, because I, I don't think if we if we had a if tomorrow uh, libertarian principles were implemented in in the United States, so government was drastically cut back. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that will solve the, uh, the, the damage that can be done in, in the name of business and in the name of religion. Uh, now, to give you one, just one example off the top of my head. So, in, in, not, in, not too long ago, the fire department was a privately owned organization. Mm -hmm. You had to pay uh, you had to pay a fee to uh, use their services and if you did not pay their fee they let the house burn down. They let the house burn down. Yeah. N now uh, I view that as uh, profoundly tyrannical. Okay, so you the, the because because the 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 uh the fire department or or whatever it was called back then <laughs> was using uh it was using the the uh money over people's heads. It was saying, you know, you pay us money or we're going to let your house burn down. And I think that is profoundly disturbing and I have no problem with the government <laughs> having a fi having a, f a fire department which will uh, put my uh, or put the fire out whether I paid them anything or not. You see, it, it is you can use money uh, or a business can use money to uh, coerce people to do things. Okay, so. I, I, okay, so, so 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 in that example, well, I, I I guess one what I would say is at this point in my life as a libertarian, I, I do think it's the government's role to um to limit externalities, and I think fires are, f f I I'm I'm not completely against police departments and fire departments for that reason, um because fires are dangerous to everybody in the community, and you can't just let one house burn down. You'd have to. You, you couldn't do that. Um, so that, that's like one of the one of the few handful of things I'd be okay with government funding. Um, but I, I, I guess. So I guess that's a simplified way of thinking of it in my book. So I well okay. Well, let's start with the the use of the term tyrannical. I don't think that's tyrannical. I think it's wrong. I think it's morally wrong. But I think there's different than difference between authoritarianism and tyranny tyranny than there is acting morally wrong. Like, like, yeah, if somebody has all the resources to help you and they choose not to, even though you're clearly in a time of rare hardship, um, then yeah, that, that's wrong. Now, but that doesn't mean it's tyrann tyrannical. I, I just don't think Authoritarian would have been a better, better. No, I, I mean, I don't think authoritarian is either because they aren't, they aren't putting anything on you. They, they're, they're just aren't helping you. And like, they, they should help you. They shouldn't be awful, but they, um, but, but, they, they aren't forcing something on you, which is typically what fascists, authoritarians, and uh, tyrants do. Um, now, I, I guess... Well, they basically are forcing something on you, though, because... Well, they're, 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 they're if, just if not you, offering you, their service. If you, if, you, if you want your house... Per, if you want protection for your house, that they are, if, if you wanted protection uh, on your, for your property at the time, you had to give them money. Well, okay. So I, I think there are a lot of assumptions baked in though. Like, 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 I mean, no, I like, I think you have a valid point. I do. I do. To, to some extent. But I also think well, like if you imagined all law disappeared and then it was 10 years later, how this would work out is there'd be probably multiple fire departments. Um, you'd probably get to shop around. It'd probably be more like an insurance plan than anything. Um, and then you'd pay a monthly fee and then you'd know you're covered. And it probably wouldn't be that outrageous because fires are really rare. Um, 
so I, I don't think it'd be them unless it was like a weird monopoly, but monopolies wouldn't happen in for fire departments. I don't see why they would. All you'd have to do is be able to buy a fleet of cars and um, have access to water to fight it. Um, so I just don't see why that would be. It wouldn't be that expensive more than a lot of insurance that people already pay for. Let me put it uh, put it to you in a different way. Uh, so we we uh, let, let's put ter- words like tyranny and authoritarian aside. Um, I, I I think what I'm trying to get at is the uh, a business can uh, use its power over the consumer. Uh, a religious authority can use its power over the uh, religious person or the non-religious person for that matter. The government can use uh, its power over citizens or non-citizens alike. Now, so th- I guess that, that that is my point is that okay, okay. You, you can... Okay. You, I, I think I'm understanding the distinction now. I, I think you look at it as there in all three of these scenarios, there's some sort of power dynamic. And for me, I understand there's power dynamic in all three, but I think the government one is uniquely problematic. Well, yeah, think th- 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 that's, I think that's our, dis- uh, that's our decision. Yeah, and, and I, I think it's specifically because when I think a business doesn't offer services or you can't pay for their services, I can think that they should help you and it'd be nice if they did. But the element of, but I think everybody has their own autonomy to act how they want to, even if I think it's immoral. Government's the only one who's actively coercing people. And I think that's a unique problem I have with what they're doing that you don't have. Well, yeah, and I think I I I just define coercion differently. Well, okay. Well, okay, well then... But again, we don't, I don't, I'm not trying to get into, you know, I'm not trying to uh, uh, throw out, throw out word salad. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just once somebody is actively forcing somebody to pay something, then I have a problem with it. Um, but like, and that's how that's how taxes work. You, you get thrown in a cage, and it's and the, I I guess the more I expanded on the uh, fire department definition in my head, though, the more I think about scenarios that are pretty similar to it that we're okay with in today's world, though. Like, if you don't have car insurance for your own car, because you can have car insurance that minimally protects the other person in the accident. That's like the only legal requirement. You could be a pretty broke dude. You can total your car, go to the mechanic, and they say this costs 2000 bucks to fix. And if you don't have 2000 bucks, they don't fix it no matter how much you need your car to get to your job or to get home or to do anything. And it's like tough luck, get over it um, because you can't pay them. And that, that's similar to the fire department. If your house is on fire, they're not going to help you. They're going to let your, your, your property burn to the ground. Well, tough luck. That sucks. So, well, like, like, sure, one of them is much more personal. People feel more strongly about their castle and their where, where, where they live, and there's a potential loss of life that you don't have at the mechanic. But they're they're pretty similar scenarios, and we're okay with the market regulating. You know, we're we're, we're okay with uh, you know people who work on cars to just deny service if people can't pay for it. Well, in in that case, though, then what do you think about a uh, a family member of mine actually? Um, he uh, didn't have car insurance, and he mm-hmm. got in a wreck, and he got mm-hmm. his license taken away. So then, then what? What is your view then of that? Do you think the government does not have the right to take his license away? Well, or, I mean, well, sorry, not right. I sorry, I didn't mean to use the term right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I think there actually is a somewhat interesting question about li- li- about having licenses for vehicles at all, because if you do take it upon yourself to get on the road and drive a vehicle. You are accepting liability, and if you you know drive poorly, those people you are liable for if it's your fault. You know that, that's why we have civil courts. So that will already kind of discriminate against people who aren't willing to take that risk because they are bad enough drivers, um, and that that should already be off-putting enough for people like that. Um, so I think it is pretty ridiculous. Like like oh you got in a wreck, it's your fault. The government really probably shouldn't be taking your license. Um, but the government can phrase it as, well, it's a privilege we give you when, I mean, I don't see why we do even conceptualize it as the government has to give us the ability to drive, you know, I, so yes, I'm discovering in this uh, episode that I am pretty anti, uh, (laughs) I'm pretty anti driver's license to some extent. 
Mm. I mean, it's kind of like how some people think, um, well, maybe, maybe that's not a good comparison. So maybe I shouldn't even open that can of worms. I'm not going to. <laughs> I, I decided against it. Uh, that was a, that was a bad. Uh, well, I, I know what I know what you mean. Uh, I think I know what you mean. Okay. Okay. Well, well, did you have a different thought on that about licenses? No, actually, I don't have an opinion on licenses. Oh, okay. 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 Do 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 we do we beat libertarianism and rights to death? Are we going to move on? We, we we dug a rabbit hole and we went down it for about forty five minutes. I, I think. Uh, yeah, I think we've done. We've uh, <laughs> we've. Uh, uh, pontificated on uh, libertarianism for long enough. Okay, that was good. That was good. Okay, so do you want to lead in on uh, AOC? Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So, uh, recently, I don't have the article pulled up here, so I'm. this is all going on memory. <laughs> recently, uh, I think a video uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez released I don't remember if it was on Twitter or something. Uh, anyway, some video she released recently. Um, she was, she called uh, the, uh, well, l l I guess I, I need to give a little context. Uh, everybody knows that um, immigration has been a big issue recently. Uh, in fact, globally. I mean, it's, a, it's been a global issue. Uh, both in in uh, in North uh, and South America and in uh, Europe, uh, and so the uh, our current president Donald Trump, he uh, one of his uh, platforms uh, during the campaign or one of his uh, big ideas during his campaign was uh, we're going to build a wall on the southern border. We're we're going to. Uh, we're, we're going, and that is going to stop illegal immigration. Now, they uh, so the government has been cracking down on illegal immigration, uh, mainly in in uh, in, in the uh, in this sense that uh, certain uh, immigrants have been put in. Detention centers. Now, uh, Cortez used the term concentration camps. Uh, ch ch would you like me to go ahead and give my take, or, or would you? Okay. Uh, my, my take is actually a very, it's a very simple critique, uh, and it's also one that is infuriating to probably almost everyone on the left. <laughs> And and that's this. I I just think it's a poor choice of words because for and and for this reason, when when you hear the term concentration camps, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? First thing that comes to your mind is the Holocaust, genocide, and b because of that. I think it looks bad on the part of left-wing uh, activists and politicians and commentators to use the term concentration camps. It's going to alienate probably some of the more moderate or, or um, undecided people. It's going to alienate them away from you. And it's... Uh, well, yeah, that, that's the that's the main that's the main uh, uh, crux of it. Yeah, I mean uh, that was a good job of laying it out there, and um, I, I think this brought something similar to mind. I mean, it's kind of what you're saying. Um, something can be literally true, but be very misleading. Exactly. And, and the, the, I mean the the, the the if if yeah in in the literal definition of the terms, yes, they are concentration camps insofar as a group of people is concentrated in a guarded uh, camp. Yeah, and to some extent it's like, well, we, we, we do all know their conditions are poor, and it's like, well, they were poor then, and then it's like, okay, but it's missing the big, you know, genocide part that the people associated with it. And, um, yeah, the, okay, so, I, I but it's, it's kind of like if you said um, Hitler is really similar to President Obama, 
because they both talked to large groups of people while they were on the platform. And it's like, wow, that's literally true. They're both <laughs> leaders of a country, and they both talked to huge crowds, and uh, they, they, they gave uh, speeches that some people liked and some people didn't like. <laughs> well, that's a good one. Um, and it's like, but you know, that, that doesn't mean they're the same thing. They're, they're, you can draw similarities between me and my cat, because we both have hearts that beat, and we both are made of a lot of water. Um, and we're both <laughs> mammals. So it's one of those things where, um, and this is why people hate fact-checking organizations, is because um, a lot of the left-leaning ones, they'll, they'll take a, what a right-wing person says, that'll be like technically true, and then they'll be like misleading, but then a Democrat will say something that's technically true but misleading, and then say it's like, well, yeah, that's mostly true. Um, and then that, that's why even a fact-checker who can technically be saying the truth can be misleading. Um, that's something that I found very frustrating because there was one time where uh, Mike Pence specifically got like a uh, false rating on a claim and his claim was about how there was the most people employed in our country ever. And they're like, yeah, that's true, but that's false because percentage wise, it's not true. He, but it's like, well, yeah, but Mike Pence just said the number of people. He didn't say that the rate, but since it could be misconstrued that way, because it is a stupid stat point to say, because our population has been growing over time. They're like, well, that's misleading, so it might as well be false, even though it was literally true. So yeah. Um, then uh, the other thing that I hated about this story is it just shows that every time we could have relative consensus, somebody has to ruin it. So the, the, there's a lot of people who are right wing who would agree, yeah, we don't want to let them into our country, but we can agree those conditions aren't good. And you'll you'll see that still on some stories. Um, about the conditions being uniquely bad, conservative commentators will respond and say, that's abhorrent, we should help them. Um, but when you have the divisive language of comparing everything to like the Holocaust or you know World War II, then you're going to get everybody to all, all of a sudden pick a side on partisan lines. And you've now made something that we could like 75% agree on, like, okay, maybe we don't agree on if they should be in these camps or not, or in these... Uh, and like, 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 do we want to keep them there? Yes or no? That's a different argument. But should we make those conditions better while they're there? Probably like 80% of people would agree. But now mm -hmm. that this story's come out, it's probably 50-50 split because that's how easily, you know, tribalized everybody is. You, you've just hit the nail on, on the head there. I, I think people, I, I, don't, I mean, this might be just a defect in the, in the human character. I don't know. Everything has to be the worst thing ever. So it, nobody wants to hear about your second worst day ever. It has to be the worst day ever. Um, nobody ever wants to hear about the second uh, greatest mass killing ever. It has to be the greatest mass killing ever. So, so it, it, you know, it, it, it's, and this is just, it's so, this is so, it makes me so angry uh, <laughs> when people um, co constantly uh, compare Trump to Hitler, you know, because I, I find myself in a position where I have to defend uh, Donald Trump <laughs> because, it, it, I mean, there is no comparison. I mean, again, there, there, you can make rudimentary comparisons. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 you know, it, they are con two completely different people and two completely different uh, times and they obviously had or, or, or uh, have uh, two completely different uh, uh, purposes. You, you know, the, it, it, as far as I can tell, um, <laughs> the purpose of Donald Trump is to propagate the uh, legacy and uh, the, the uh, financial. Uh, empire uh, of Donald Trump. <laughs> that is his main concern, himself. What was Hitler's main concern? It was propagating Nazi ideology. It was to create a th create a uh, cr cr create a uh, eternal um, empire based on uh, racist, barbaric uh, principles. And I think what you just hit on there and what, what I was kind of saying before, too, is kind of what, what sows so much distrust in the news over like the last five years is because the news will do a lot of they'll, they'll, they'll do a lot of literally true, but that's not really how you should interpret it. And that that's like 
And that's why some of their stuff, especially to people who aren't in a left-wing bubble, reads as ridiculous. Because Bill Maher has been pushing this thing for, I want to say, like two, two months, where he genuinely believes, you can tell that he genuinely believes that if Trump gets voted out of office, he doesn't think Trump would willingly leave office. And it's like, okay, like I get not liking him. I get thinking he's stupid. I think most of the times when he's authoritarian, it's because he doesn't even conceptualize any kind of principles. He just says things <laughs> that he likes exactly. and things he doesn't like. And a lot exactly. of times they're not even consistent with each other. And then that's okay. He's just a guy who says stuff. Like, and sometimes it comes out really offensive and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes I like it because it's just a really mixed bag. Um, but, but people have this way of immediately saying, well, here's a thing about his uh, supporters, they, they defend him no matter what, even when he contradicts himself. It's like a cult, and you know who had cultish followers? Hitler. Um, and then there's like this, and it's like, wow, these 40% of Americans approve of Trump no matter what he does. Wow, he has this such a, such a strong following, even when he does stupid things and totalitarian things. It's disturbing like a, like a tyrant. And it's like, you're kind of missing the point, I feel like. It's like, sure, you can make all these comparisons of well, whatever policy is authoritarian or he doesn't really respect our uh, our balance of powers. And I think it's mostly out of ignorance and uh, just um, expedience. I think that's the main reason why he doesn't respect him. But it's like, oh, he doesn't respect him. And all these fascist countries don't have balance of powers. And Trump wishes he could be Kim Jong-un, but of America. And, you know, it's 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 missing the point. Um and I end up I end up defending Trump when I don't like him at all. I wish he wasn't president. I wish like uh, at least like the Republicans I don't like that it really don't like government. Like 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 even Ted Cruz, he is principled about how he thinks government shouldn't do most of the things they do. And it's like I disagree with Ted Cruz a lot, like a lot. But like hey, at least he'd have principles I can somewhat agree with. So the I, difference I wish... between a Ted Cruz or the difference between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, in my view, is that Ted Cruz is a political person. Donald Trump is not. Well, and that, that's why Donald Trump, the people who are actually, um, I would say. Uh, and that, that, that's why people, I mean, that's why he was attractive is he wasn't, you know, a part of the establishment. Yeah, but beyond like the typical tribal pundits, and this is why I hear a lot in the libertarian community, there's surprisingly a lot of defense of them because I think libertarians are less tribal in the sense that they don't blindly defend their politicians because their politicians aren't as noteworthy in name. So when Trump does something libertarians like, libertarians jump on board and they say, awesome, Trump, we love your, I love how you're suddenly an anti-interventionist. Hopefully you stick with it. And people will pat him on the back for it. Um, but, but, you, but the way we've seen Republican um, orthodoxy shift, Republicans aren't the party of free trade anymore. And in opposition to Trump, Democrats are becoming the party of free trade. And that's not how it was like 10 years ago even or seven years ago. And that, that's crazy for me to imagine. Um, I don't know how we ended up on this. Oh, we were talking about uh, hyper-partisanship language in, uh, with, with AOC. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to – there was one more thing I wanted to riff off on this topic. And this is how the news is uh, simultaneously the least substantive thing in the existence of humanity. Because how little – I care so little – about one congressman for a state I don't live in saying something stupid. And this shouldn't matter to anybody. And we're talking about this this story now that it's pretty much blown over. And this was top of the news for at least a week and a half. And I find that completely abhorrent. I don't, I don't know if you have strong feelings on that. Which news story are we referring to now? The, the AOC doing her concentration camp line. Oh, so, so, so you're, you're saying you just don't care. Yeah, like, like in general, like this shouldn't be a story that dominated the headlines. This has no relevance to policy. I agree. She, she, she just said something dramatic, and then it was who would con condemn her and who won't condemn her and who will join in and jump in on it. And it's like, why do any of us care about this? No, I could go, I mean, I, I won't right now, but I could go on probably like a 10-minute rant about the media. <laughs> yeah. Well, well the, you know what? Okay. This is where I this is where I get really dicey because to some extent I don't blame the media. I blame you know um, the uh, people in our country because people in our country like that stuff. People like the culture wars. People like bashing on AOC because she says stupid stuff, and people like bashing on Trump because he says stupid stuff. And people feed on that, 
and people turn it into like this entertainment, you know, kind of a spectacle. It has nothing to do with anything that will affect any of our lives. Nothing. Like the amount of time spent on this story over a week is more than people will talk about social security on the news for two years. And that's ridiculous. So that, that that's my, that's my charged rant right there. I was saving that one up. I agree. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, we're hitting the hour mark, so, and we, we, it seems like we just wrapped that story up nicely, so I think we should close this one off, okay? So Sounds gonna, like a plan. Okay, so, uh, so once again, I just want to say you can find us on, on all the uh, normal places. You can find podcasts. I think we're on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, maybe. I don't know. I haven't checked in on that. We, we're definitely on Spotify, and we're on SoundCloud, and if you search The Anti-Philosopher, you'll get directed towards uh, my co-host here, his YouTube channel. And he posts all our episodes. So if you don't want to just hear our voices and you want to see the uh, Sharknado 2 poster behind me, then you can watch that version as well. And, and you want to see me look like a, a drug dealer. <laughs> in, your, in your spooky lighting, yeah. In my spooky lighting, yes. Exactly. Okay, so signing off after all those good rants, and I, I definitely needed to exercise those. I've been holding those in for a little bit. Um, signing off, Mad Matt. And Matt.